remembers what we chanted yesterday? Who remembers the opulences yesterday? We were talking about, remember, trees? And which tree did Krishna, does it represent, which tree represents Krishna? Banyan tree. tree. The banyan tree, right. And then they were talking about Rishis among the demigods. Narada. Yes, good. What else did we talk about? So what's Lurkapila? Who is Lurkapila? Yes, what philosophy did he teach? Sankhya, yes, Sankhya. And then we also spoke about one more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, among the Gandharvas, right? So who is the who is the famous singer among the Gandharvas? Chitra Yeah. Yeah, in, in the Bhakti Shastri exam we'll, they will ask questions like that. They'll give you the blank and you have to fill it in. Right? Did you do Bhakti Shastri? Yes. Did you have to do that? We didn't get the question. We didn't, we didn't get the question. Almost mostly essay questions. Oh, okay. mm. Usually closed book, they'll ask you these things. Alright? So, Uche Shravasam. What meaning? Uche Shravasam. Uche Shrava Uche Shrava Ashvata Ashvanam Ashvanam Among Horses Among Horses Vidi Vidi No No Mum Mum Me Me Amrita Udbhavam Amrita Udbhavam Produced from the from the churning of the ocean Ayravatam Ayravatam Ayravata Ayravata Gajendra Gajendra Indranam Gajendra Indranam Of lordly elephants Of lordly elephants Naranam Naranam Among human beings Among human beings Cha Cha And And Naraadipam Naraadipam The king The king Translation Of horses no meat to be Uchai Shrava Produced during the churning of the ocean for nectar of lordly elephants, I am Airavata, and among men, I am the monarch. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. The devotee demigods and the demons or asuras once took part in churning the sea. From this churning, nectar and poison were produced, and Lord Shiva drank the poison. From the nectar were produced many entities, of which there was a horse named Uche Shrava. Another animal produced from the nectar was an elephant named Airavata. Because these two animals were produced from nectar, they have special significance and they are representatives of Krishna. Amongst the human beings, the king is the representative of Krishna because Krishna is the maintainer of the universe and the kings who are appointed on account of their godly qualification are maintainers of their kingdoms. Kings like Maharaj Yudhisthira 
Maharaj Parikshit and Lord Brahma were all highly righteous kings who always thought of the citizens' welfare. In Vedic literature, the king is considered to be the representative of God. In this age, however, with the corruption of the principles of religion, monarchy decayed and is now finally abolished. It is to be understood that in the past, however, people were more happy under righteous kings. Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Katamayam Dadati Swapadam Tekam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yadapadakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Stya Shri Rupam Sakrachatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Sam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahadana Ladita Shri Vishaka Nitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Gina Bandhu Jagapate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamani Hari Priye Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Vaevacha Patitanya Bhavanegyo Vaishnavegyo Namo Namo Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadada Shri Vasadi Gora Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So how many of you have got a set of Srimad Bhagavatam at home? Not many, a few of you. Anyway, if you have the Srimad Bhagavatam, if you don't have, you could probably borrow some volumes from here. We have several sets here in the temple. If you like to read the books, it's very good. So Srimad Bhagavatam is a, a higher study from the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is the basic knowledge. Sometimes Prabhupada would describe it as like ABC, whereas the Srimad Bhagavatam is like the graduate study. Bhagavad Gita, how many chapters in the Bhagavad Gita? How many chapters in Bhagavad Gita? Yes. How many mantras in Ishopanishad? How many mantras in Ishopanishad? So much for your Bhakti Shastri. <laughs> Can't even remember how many mantras in Ishopanishad. <laughs> Eighteen. Same as in. And how many slokas in nectar of instruction? Upadesha Prita. How many verses there? Bhaktisha <laughs> Sri.
11 slokas in Upanish Amrita. So, Srimad Bhagavatam is the graduate study. It's how many cantos, Srimad Bhagavatam? Huh? 12 cantos, right? 12 cantos. How many slokas in Bhagavad Gita? 18 chapters? 700 slokas. How many verses in Srimad Bhagavatam? 18,000. 18,000. Prabhupada was saying, they would say, just to study one verse, it will take maybe one month to study one verse, to study it fully. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, Prabhupada's own spiritual teacher, had spoken on the very first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam for one month. So Prashula Prabhupada said, you, if, to understand each verse and to explain it fully, it may take one month each verse. So there are 18,000 verses, so you can reckon 18,000 months, which means how many years? 1,500 years. Hmm? You have to live a long time. One can be that old. Has to be the other yuga, right? Not this yuga. So, anyways, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam describes about the demigods and the demons and how they, you know, they're always fighting with each other, the demigods and the demons. Because the demons, they live in the lower region of the universe. And sometimes they, they, they come up to the higher regions and they conquer the demigods and they take over the heavenly planets because the demons are living in the lower region of the universe and it's very dark there. There's no sun because it's in the bottom of the universe. So they don't get sunlight. Could you imagine Kuchin with no sunlight? You know? Just like you go to England, you know, <laughs> you, you, can, you can tell what it's like, practically. Very little sun. Prabhupada, Prabhupada was in England, and they were asking Prabhupada, what is it like in hell? And Prabhupada said, oh, this is England. He said, this, he said, this is hell. He said, every day cloudy, never see the sun. So, uh, the lower regions are very dark, and the only light they have, the, the, de the demons wear jewels on their heads, and from the jewels they are able to light the place. So, often the demons are trying to conquer the demigods and take over the heavenly planets. But sometimes, the Srimad Bhagavatam describes that, at least on one occasion, the demigods and the demons made a truce and they decided to work together. They wanted to produce nectar of immortality. You know, the nectar of immortality. They wanted to pr produce some umbrit, umbrit which would, they would, they, they would live for, forever practically. They wouldn't die. And they were going to do it to do it, they had to churn the ocean, not the ordinary ocean, but the milk ocean. They had to churn the milk ocean. You know, Srimad Bhagavatam describes how there are different types of oceans. There's an ocean of sugar cane juice, and there's an ocean of milk, and there's ocean, we know salt water ocean, but there's other kinds of oceans. So there's the milk ocean and the demigods and the demons, they made a truce to churn the milk ocean to produce this nectar of immortality. If you go to Bangkok and you're in the airport there, the Suvarna, Suvarna Bumi Airport, they have a huge exhibit of the demigods and the demons churning the milk ocean. 
it's, uh, it, the pastime is very famous, especially in Cambodia also. The Cambodian people, they give a lot of importance to that. And it's also there in, the, in, this big, in this airport in Thailand. And they have a very, it's very well done. It's life-size demigods and demons. And they're churning the milk ocean. And to churn the ocean, they didn't have a rope, but they used Vashuki. They used the serpent. You know, the serpent Vashuki was used. And they were churning, and they, were, they had them banged around the Mandarachala mountain. They, so they would have this mountain, and they had Vashuki round the mountain, and the demigods were holding one end of the snake, the serpent, and the demons were holding the other end. And in this way they were pulling back and forth. But the mountain was so heavy, it was falling down. So then the Lord appeared in the form of Kurma, right, in the form of Kurma. And Kurma took the mountain on his back and supported the mountain while the demigods and the demons could churn the ocean and produce nectar. But what happened was, first of all, they produced the poison. What was it called? Halaha? The Halaha poison poison. And so what to do with the poison? So they requested Lord Shiva that you could drink the poison. So what would Parvati think? <laughs> that her husband's going to drink the poison. But Parvati understood that her, hus her, her husband was a great soul and she was happy that he was going to do that. Although usually the wife would think, oh no, don't you do it. You know? But Parvati was happy. My husband, yeah, he can, he can do that. He is very powerful. She knew the power of her husband. So Lord Shiva drank the poison, and when he drank the poison, then what happened? What color did his throat become? Blue. Blue. So he got the name? Nila? Nila Kachala. Nila Kanta. Nila Kanta. Nila Kanta. Yes. And because he drank the poison, it became very hot. You know, when, if you drink poison, you know, it puts a lot of heat in the body. So that's when he got that crescent moon on his head. Lord Shiva always wears the crescent moon. The, the moon is very cooling. And so the moon was put on the head of Lord Shiva to cool it because of drinking all the poison. So this is the uh, benevolence of Lord Shiva that he is very kind, he does these things for the benefit of others. Of course, when he was drinking the poison, he was drinking, he took it in his hand to drink, but a few drops fell down, and those few drops were taken by scorpions, and poison snakes, and some poison plants also, so they got it from the churning of the ocean, the, the poison which dropped from the hand of Lord Shiva. So the demigods and the demons, they, they got the nectar. Uh, well, they were churning. First they got the poison and Lord Shiva drank the poison. And then after that they kept churning and then different entities were produced from the churning. Right? So we hear about Uchishrava. Uchishrava is a very special horse which happened to come out of the churning of the ocean. And that horse was given to Bali Maharaj. You know Bali Maharaj? Bali Maharaj? Who is Bali Maharaj? Huh? Yeah, yeah, he's Prahlad's what? Grandson. Yes. So he's a demon. 
Bawi Maharaj is from the family of the demons, but they gave him this Ocheshrapa. He got the horse. And then they kept churning and they got this Airavata. Airavata Gajendranam. He's a Gaja. Gaja means elephant. elephant. Yes. We have in Srimad Bhagavatam the nice story about Gajendra Moksha. How the elephant Gajendra, the king of the elephants, got liberation. So here is Airavata. He also was produced from the churning of the ocean. And he was given to Indra. Yes, the king of heaven. So there were other elephants also produced when they were churning the milk ocean. Not something you would expect to come out of the ocean. You know? <laughs> yeah. But somehow, and the other other things, oh, who else came from the churning of the ocean? You know? Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, she came from the churning of the ocean. And she was thinking who to take for a husband and she was looking at the man, mm, mm, no, not him, no, this, no, no. And she couldn't, and then already she took Lord Narayan for her husband. So everyone was happy that the goddess of fortune became the consort of Lord Narayan. So she came, and I saw, I was just looking at your Tausi altar outside, and there's a notice there, and it said Tosi also came from the churning of the milk ocean. So many different wonderful things all came from the churning of the milk ocean. It's a very nice pastime. It's in the eighth canto, canto eight of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So these two creatures are Famous, Uchishrava and Airavata. <coughs> we also hear about Airavata uh, when Indra was fighting against the demon Vritasura. <coughs> the Vritasura, Vritasura was a big demon who was actually a devotee in his previous life. He was Chitra Ketu previously. <coughs> so Chitra Ketu, Maharaj Chitra Ketu got cursed by Mother Parvati because Chitra Ketu was traveling and he came to the abode of Lord Shiva and he happened to see Lord Shiva sitting in an, in an assembly of great saintly persons. But Lord Shiva was sitting with his good wife Parvati and Parvati was sitting on the lap of Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva was embracing his wife and he was embracing her in the, in the presence of many uh, saintly and renounced people. So Chitra Ketu came there and he was surprised to see the situation and he laughed. And so Mother Parvati didn't like it and she thought, you don't know how to respect my husband. You don't deserve to be uh, a king, you should become a, a demon. So she cursed him to become a demon. So Chitra Ketu, being cursed by Mother Parvati, he offered his obeisances to her. And he said, thank you, Mother. When you get cursed, you can also respond, right? Thank you, Prabhu. <laughs> Thank you, Mataji, for cursing me. So
So Chitra, Mother Chitra Ketu was surprised that, oh, he didn't get angry because usually you curse someone, you think they'll get angry, you know, and, or they'll be upset. But Chitra, Chitra Ketu just said, thank you, Mother. And Mother Parvati was shocked and she asked her husband, what? Uh, why is he not disturbed? And Lord Shiva told his wife, Narayana Parastave, Nakutas Chanyavivyate, Swarga Apavarga Narakesh, Vapitu Yatadarshana. That those who have taken shelter of the Supreme Lord, like Lord Narayan, that they're not afraid of anything. They see heaven and hell and liberation all the same. They don't see it make any distinction between one place and the other. I said, this is the greatness of the devotees of Lord Narayan. So Mother Parvati was instructed like that. Anyway, Chitra Ketu got cursed and so he took birth as a, the demon Vritasura. He was actually born in the Brahmana family. There had been some uh, cheating going on. Indra had hired a Brahmana. Well, first of all, Indra had lost his guru, Brihaspati. And so they asked Lord Brahma what to do. And so he recommended another Brahmana. He said, this is a powerful man. He could be a priest for you. So Indra hired him. But it turned out the one, the person who he hired to be his priest, that he was from a mixed birth. The father was at the, from the side of the, the Devas. But the mother was from the side of the demons. You know, you get things like that, mixed birth, the father's from one side, mother's from the other side. So the, the, this man, the, 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 he was a son, he, he had feelings for both the demigods and the demons. So he was supposed to offer oblations in favor of the demigods. But he would also offer oblations in favor of the demons. So when Indra found out, Indra was very angry and Indra killed him. But when he killed him, then the father of this man who was killed by Indra, he did another yajna to produce a son who could kill Indra, or who would be the enemy of Indra. So he got this big demon, Vrita. Vrita means spread everywhere. Means it's very big, very big size. You know, spread everywhere. A very ferocious, frightening looking demon. And when he appeared, the demigods, when they saw him coming, they just ran. They were just terrified. They'd never seen such a ferocious looking demon with the copper colored hair and, and carrying his trident. So this was Chitra Ketu. In one life he was a king, next life he became this demon, Vritasura. So Indra had to fight him. So Indra had to fight him. So Indra didn't know how to fight him. So he, he thought, I'll go to Lord, Lord Narayan, and I'll ask Lord Narayan to fight him. He thought, I, I, Indra thought, I won't be able to defeat, defeat him myself. Lord Narayan will have to come himself and kill him. So he went to see Lord Narayan, but Lord Narayan said, Oh no, I'm not going to kill him. You want to kill him, you kill him yourself. The Lord Narayan said, I'm not going to kill him. You do your own dirty work. Because he was the son of a Brahmin. Although he was in the body of a demon, 
he was coming from the Brahmana family. So to kill a Brahmana is not very good, you know, it's a very bad thing. So the Lord said, I'm not going to kill him. You want to kill him, you kill him yourself. But he said, anyway, he said, you know, you, you need help. So you can go to, there's one man, there's a yogi, there's a great soul named Dadichi. And Dadichi, he may be able to help you. He said, because to kill this demon, you need to make a weapon. And you can, you, to make this weapon, to kill this demon, you need to get the bones from the body of a great yogi. If you can get the bones from the body of a great person, then you can use their bones to make a weapon, to make the braja, the interest weapon, the braja, the thunderbolt weapon. And this way you can kill the demon. So Indra had to go to, to Dadichi. If you go to Naimasharanya, have you been to Naimasharanya? Did you ever go to Naimasharanya? You know, you know Naimasharanya? You heard the name? Naimasharanya? Where the Sutta Goswami met with all the sages. 88,000 sages, they were doing yagya for the Kali Yuga. So the Dichi's ashram is there at Naimasharanya. You'll see, just, just beside Naimasharanya, there's the ashram of the Dichi Muni. So Indra had to go there to see the Dichi, and he had to ask the Dichi, Please, can you give the body, can you give the bones from your body? <laughs> what do you think, Prabhu? Would you like to give the bones from your body? <laughs> so Indra had to ask Dadichi. Dadichi looked at him and said, Oh, you want the bones from my body? Don't you know that body is the thing we're most attached to? Is it? You rascal. <laughs> You're attached to the body. You should be detached. We have to become detached from the body, right? Yes. Don't be attached. Yeah, but is it, the body is the thing we're most attached to. We'll, we'll give up so much money for the body, you pay the doctors for the body. So, Dadichi was actually a great yogi, he was very rich in doing tapasya. But he wanted to hear philosophy from Indra. So he was testing Indra. He said to Indra, oh come on, the body, you want me to give the bones from my body? That's the thing we're most attached to. So Indra said to Dadichi, he said, well, you know, he said, I know sometimes it's difficult to give charity, but you should know also sometimes it's difficult to ask for charity. <laughs> right? Sometimes there, you get some people, they don't like to ask for charity, you know. If you ask some devotee, you go, go and sell books. Oh, oh. You know, they feel shy. Some, some people, they don't like to approach people to ask for money to sell a book. They, they're, not very, they're not very bold. So Indra was saying, I know sometimes it's difficult to give charity, but it's also difficult sometimes to ask charity. So then he just said, oh, very good, yes, all right. I will give the bones from my body. So Dadichi gave up his body and Indra got the bones from his body and he used the bones to make his braja weapon, the braja weapon, and he used that weapon to fight Fritasura. And he killed Fritasura. Well, even that is controversial. Did he kill Fritasura? At one point, he was fighting Ritasura. He cut off his one arm, then he cut off another arm. 
Britasura had no arms left, but he was so big, he just he opened his mouth and swallowed Indra. He just swallowed him right inside. So Indra en entered into this into the belly of Britasura. But Indra was protected because he had his weapon and he had been chanting Narayan Kavacha. By chanting Narayan Kavacha, no harm could come to him. You chant Narayan Kavacha? It's in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Narayana Kavacha. Kavacha, shield, right? Armor, protect. So Lord Narayan could protect us from danger. So Indra was, although he was swallowed into the body of Vritasura, Vritasura then sat down, went into Samadhi and left the body. And Indra was still inside the body. He cut his way out with the weapon. And he cut his way out. He came out from the belly of Vritasura. And then he cut off the head of Vritasura. And it took him one year to cut off the head of Britain's. <laughs> so, in this way, but what happened when they were fighting, Indra was on Airavrata, he was riding Airavrata, the elephant, and he was thinking, you know, I'm on Airavrata, I will be powerful. But Britasura was so powerful, he just pushed Airavrata, pushed him back many yards and knocked off, he, he hit Airavrata with his, with his trident. Airavrata was all bleeding. So Airavrata, he, he got beaten by this Vritasura. But because Indra was there, so Indra had some powers, he could heal with his magic powers, could protect. So Airavrata was saved. Anyway, that's that's one example about Airavata, the great elephant, Indra's elephant. Prabhupada's purport mainly he speaks he speaks about he's speaking about the last part of man, I am the monarch. Naranam chara naradi pam. Naranam. Among men, I am the monarch. So the king is always given, of course, special honor, special respect is given to the king because he's the, the representative of God. Prabhupada says monarchy is finished. At least in India, monarchy is finished. But we there still have kings here in Malaysia. You have rulers. In England also, we have a king. The, the queen died recently, and then the, her son became the king. But uh, we used to, I remember uh, when I was young, that we had the custom, they always sang the national anthem and the national anthem is something like, God save our gracious king, or God save our gracious queen, something like this, you know. So, so the, the, the queen, is, or the king, they're given very special honor and respect. One time, uh, there was one university, and the queen went to visit that university. And there were some students there who were very rebellious. <clears throat> and they, when the queen came to visit there, they actually wrote placards up, down with the queen, we don't want the queen. <laughs> and, and it was such a, it, it, it got so much criticism that those boys, who, those students who did that, they were put out of the university. They were expelled. And they were even thinking to close the whole university because of what had happened. So giving respect to the monarch is such an important issue that if we don't show that respect, then it, it's a crime. In Thailand, they have also a king. 
And if you say anything bad about the king, they take you to court and you can be put in jail or punished or fined. It's a, a serious crime. Sometimes there was a case, there was one German man and he was maybe drinking or something and he said, Ah, oh, that guy, you know, he said something very nasty about the king. And so he got arrested. The police, some, somebody called the police and the police came and arrested him and he was taken to court. But when, he, when the case came to court, the king dropped charges against him. The king was, was merciful. But it doesn't always happen like that. You know? <laughs> Sometimes people get punished. So the monarch is the representative of God, the representative of Krishna. But they have a duty to perform, just like in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes. Well, Yadyada Charity. Shrista, tatat eva tarojana, sayat pramanam kurute lokastad anuvartate. Whatever actions are performed by the leaders, then other people will follow. Whatever standards they set by their behavior will influence the people. So the position of the king is very important. The Lord Krishna says, he gives an example, he said, first of all he talks about Janaka, that Maharaj Janak. Have you been to Nepal? Did you go to Janakpur? Did you go to Janak Janakpur? You been there? Yeah? Janakpur? Yes. No? You went where? Muktinath. 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 You didn't go to Janakpur. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, Jan Maharaj Janak, his place is there, and uh, he was a great king. Yes. But he, he always did his duty. He was not a lazy person. He set a high example, a great example for others. He would give charity, and he would give charity profusely to people. He would give so much charity, he was very generous. And he was very a strict ruler. If there were infidels and dacoits, no, he would come and deal with them. He didn't let the situation go to hell. You know, he was very careful, very cautious to govern the kingdom and to protect his people. So Lord Krishna in the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita, he's talking about detached Work, uh, working in a detached manner. And he gives an example about great souls who really, they don't have any duty to do, but still they engage in work. And he gives an example of Janak Maharaj, and then he gives an example of his own self. And Lord Krishna said, and even I am engaged in activities. Although I am the Lord of all the world and I don't have anything really to do, but I'm engaged in activities. Why? Because it's important to show the example for others. So the king has that responsibility. The monarch, they have a, a very great responsibility. Actually, Prabhupada writes that all the leaders of society have that responsibility. The father has the duty to show the example to the family. The head of the company, the head of the state, the politicians, they all have that duty. And brahmanas, they, all, they have to show the example to other people. And our Krishna consciousness movement is also meant for that. We have to show an example to the society. What is the proper standard of behavior? So the monarch, particularly someone's a monarch of a country, it's a very big position. They have a great responsibility to set the highest standard in terms of character and behavior, and morality and religious principles. So 
this monarch is said to be representative of Lord Krishna. And Prabhupada talks about the wonderful example of Lord Rama and Maharaj Yudhisthira and Maharaj Parikshit. And in Srimad Bhagavatam, we read about Maharaj Parikshit as the monarch. He was ruling, going around the kingdom. He was not just sitting back in his palace and sending people out to go around, but he would go around himself. And when he saw somebody uh, who was uh, dealing nastily with the cow and the bull, he was ready to kill that person. Maharaj Parikshit came across a person dressed like a king, but he could understand immediately that this person was not actually a king, that he was a sutra, but he was dressed like a king. He was wearing a crown and he had a sword in his hand and he was threatening the cow who was standing with tears in her eyes. And there was a bull standing on only a portion of one leg, trembling. So when Maharaj Parikshit saw this, he was shocked that in his kingdom anyone would dare to abuse a cow. And he was immediately ready to kill that person. But the personality of Kali surrendered to him. So Maharaj Parikshit then said, All right, but you can only stay where there is meat eating, intoxication, gambling, and illicit sex. You can only stay where these activities are going on. But the personality of Kali said, Oh, then I have nowhere to stay because I know there's in your kingdom none of these activities are going on. So you've not given me any real place to stay because there's nowhere where these things are going on in your kingdom. So you have to give me some other concession. So then Maharaj Parikshit said, then you can stay where there is hoarding of gold, where people are keeping more wealth than it is actually necessary for their maintenance. And where there is hoarding of wealth, then all the sinful activities will come. So we see that wherever there's economic development, improvement in the financial condition, the people become more sinful. The world doesn't become better, rather it becomes worse. And we go to, more down to hell. Anyway, this is the situation in the world. And uh, monarchs are actually, as Prabhupada points out, Monarchs are actually a very good, monarchy is a very good system to rule a country. We don't have mo uh, kings with power really. Although you have kings here in Malaysia, they don't have any power. They're not ruling. And similarly also in England and in Thailand, although they may have monarchs, they don't have power. You know, they're just given some honor some position, but they're not, in, in terms of actually ruling the country, they, they don't do anything. But Prabhupada said that the monarch is actually a good system, it's actually good to have a monarch rather than politicians, because politicians, uh, if someone's a king, they have some piety to actually take birth like that into such a royal family. Just like when Maharaj Parikshit was born, you can read in the Srimad Bhagavatam, at the birth of Maharaj Parikshit, they brought the astrologers, the Brahmanas, and they wanted to know what are the qualities of this child? What, what, what's he going to be like once he grows up? And from the birth chart, 
the astrologers could predict what is the nature of the child, what kind of qualities he will have. So they, they told how Maharaj Parikshit would be very great king, very wonderful, with all kinds of good qualities. So somebody who's born in that kind of background, they have to have had some piety from their previous life to be born into the, the family of royalty. And uh, that indicates that they, that they will be more powerful and they can be a, a good example for others. Lord Rama was such a great king. He ruled the world for thousands of years. And people always talk about Rama Raja, that they want the they want to have another ruler like Lord Rama. He was such a, a, a great ruler that people loved him so much. It is said in the times of Lord Rama, people would come to see him every day and they would come and offer their obeisances to him. So there was this one Brahmana he was very devoted to Lord Rama and every morning he would come and go to see Lord Rama offer his obeisances. But sometimes Lord Rama would go out around the kingdom and go and travel around the kingdom to make sure everything was going on nicely. So if the Brahmana could not see Lord Rama, he would fast. He would not take any food. And he would remain fasting until Lord Rama returned. And he would only take food once Lord Rama returned. So when Lord Rama heard about this, Lord Rama was shocked to think that somebody is doing like that. So Lord Rama then gave a deity of his own self to the man. And he told the Brahmana, Bra he said, you just worship my deity. And in this way, this is as good as my presence. And that deity is still being worshipped today at Udupi, in the, in the temple of Madhvacharya there in Udupi. And so worshipping the deity is non different from the Lord. Those of you who have deities, you should worship very carefully. We want to try to have very nice standards in deity worship. The, the Lord appears in the deity form. So, of men, I am the monarch. Lord Krishna comes in the form of the king. We have to see Lord Krishna present in so many different ways in this world. Right? We said, when we drink water, the I am the taste in water. I am the light of the sun and the moon. The syllable Om in the Vedic mantras. Right? Of beasts, who is Lord Krishna? Lion. The lion. Of mountains. Huh? Mountains, I am? Meru. Yes. And of rivers, I am? Ganges, yes. Among the demons I am? Prahlad. Yeah. And what was some more? Okay. So, there are many opulences there. I think that's something Lord Krishna has mentioned more than 60 in the course of Bhagavad Gita. So especially from the elements, we can understand Krishna. The sound in ether, the taste in water, the light of the fire, the original fragrance of... I am the original fragrance of... Huh? Where does the fragrance come from? From 
Where does the flower come from? From the earth. I am the original fragrance of the earth. Earth scents. Scents. You know, you get perfumes, it's all coming from the earth, you see. Original fragrance of the earth. So everything is coming from Krishna. We just have to understand. Okay, so just to finish, we will just sing one song. You can all join. You know, Sri Nam Kirtan, Yes Mati Nan. You know? Yeso mati nandana prajapada nakara Kokula nandana mana Yeso mati nandana prajapada nakara Kokula nandana mana mati nandana prajapada nakara
whenever there's a newcomer, we, we welcome them. We, give, we present them to the group of folks. Okay? Today we have one new guest. He is from Alostra and Kedah. From Kedah, he used to go to the center, the ISKCON center. Oh. So he saw uh, Guru Mah he, wrote, he saw Maharaj in the Facebook. It's his class and all. So, so he came to the Welcome. Very nice. Thank you, Guru. So let us chant three times Haribo. Haribo! 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 Is it, you, you know, uh, Nanda Goranga, is it? Or Palaka? There's two centers there in the last uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. 